Hello and welcome to part two of the week four lecture for THEO 100 Theological Foundations. Uh, in week four we're focusing on the Christian scriptures or the New Testament. And so in, in this part of the lecture I want to do a couple of things. First of all I want to talk about the Jesus of history in particular as he is depicted in the Gospel of Mark. I want to talk about the context or the yeah, the historical context in which Jesus appears. I want to talk about the main theme of his preaching. I want to talk about how he lived out and acted out that theme. Why his particular message and actions led him to his death. Uh, I want to talk about his parables. Um, I want to talk about um, Jesus as someone who believed in eschatology. Don't worry, I'll explain what that is. Um, I want to talk about the themes of the Christianity of Jesus in, in relation to the themes of the Christianity of Paul. And then finally I'll take just a few minutes to run through quickly the letter of Paul to the Galatians. Okay, let's talk about Jesus. First of all, who was he? Well, uh, that, that part's simple. He was a Jew. Uh, he came from uh, most likely Galilee, the northern uh, part of Israel. He was born um, around 4 to 6 BC. Uh, the Pope who uh, created uh, time as the Western world knows it believed that Jesus was born in 1 AD. Well, uh, he hit it pretty close. Jesus, it appears, although it can't be said with certainty, it appears as though Jesus was born uh, somewhere between 4 and 6 BC. Um, very little, if anything, is known about his life prior to age 30. That's when his public ministry begins. In his public ministry he was uh, a, a peasant, he was an itinerant preacher, and as you will see, he was a, a, a rebel, a social rebel, a particular kind of rebel against uh, the Roman Empire. Let's first talk about the context, or let's next talk about the context in which uh, Jesus lived. What was going on in uh, Palestine, in Israel, in the first century AD, at the time that Jesus was born? Well, in 63 BC, to back it up a little bit, the Romans had conquered Israel, had taken it over, and uh, at the time Jesus was born, uh, the Romans still dominated and occupied Israel. Now, remember that the Jews had not been in control of their own destiny since the time of the Babylonian exile in the 500s BC. And progressively they became more and more tired of foreign occupation by the Babylonians, by the Persians, by the Greeks, and now by the Romans. And progressively the Jewish people um, adopted two religious themes to help them cope, or let's say two religious themes evolved which helped them to cope with their, uh, the fact that they were under the domination of people other than themselves. First of all, their thinking um, became eschatological, apocalyptic. They were waiting and hoping for um, God to, to come and, and restore Israel to its former greatness. They were waiting for a new age. They were anxiously awaiting for a new age when all these uh, foreigners would be kicked out and Israel would once again be 
the, the, the country with the greatness that it had once known, especially at the time of David. And so they are waiting for the end of the current age, not for the end of the world. That's a misunderstanding of their, eschato of their eschatology. Let me spell eschatology. E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Eschatology. Uh, eschatology is the study or the belief in um, ult ultimate endings or, or the final age or, you know, the, the end of an age. Okay? And in, this, and in the case of the Jews, it was the end of the age of Roman domination. Okay? Um, this um, apocalyptic eschatological feeling would eventually lead to uh, a series of rebellions against the Romans, each of which was uh, cruelly put down by the Romans. The second last of these occurred in 66 AD, after the time of Jesus. It was successful for a certain period of time, and then um, uh, the Titus was sent in by his father, the, em the emperor, to destroy Israel, to put down the rebellion. And it was Titus who in 70 AD uh, destroyed the, the, the temple in Jerusalem once and for all. So the, the, to set this in context, to put this in historical context, the Jewish people are, are anxious for a new beginning. They're tired of being controlled by other people. And, so, and, and they are waiting for God to come and make things different and make things better and restore them to their former greatness. That's the first thing. The second part of their, uh, the second religious theme that evolved over the period of this 500 years since their uh, domination by foreign powers was the belief that God was going to send someone to, uh, to be his agent, his representative, to accomplish this new age, this cleaning out of, of the Romans and the restoration of Israel to its former greatness. You know, and I know, this uh, person, this figure, as the Messiah. And so, first century uh, Israel... Um, is noted for its being uh, a time of high messianic expectations. People were looking for and waiting for a Messiah who would save them from the Romans and restore them. Now the Messiah that most of them were looking for was uh, a combination of a warrior and a king. So this Messiah would be someone who would lead the Israelites into battle, lead the Jewish people into battle to wipe out their enemies, to wipe out the Romans. And then this Messiah would become king, a king like David had been. I hope you can see from this that the Messiah who, whom Jesus claimed to be and who his uh, followers claimed he was, was not in any way like the Messiah that most Jews were waiting for. Okay, so you have the eschatological expectation, you have the messianic expectation, the expectation of a Messiah. Now, during the Roman occupation, the Romans were um, attempting to commercialize Israel so that uh, they could attract people to come there and so that they could export agricultural goods to other parts of the empire. And in order to do this, and this is what the archaeological evidence uh, indicates, what they did in order to accomplish, accomplish this was a process that involved three steps. So, in other words, what were the Romans systematically doing to the Jewish people in order to commercialize Israel, and in particular, the Galilee region? 
there was a three-step process by which the Romans unjustly oppressed the Jews. Step number one, they taxed them heavily. They, they, they just taxed the heck out of them. And you know and I know that the effect of heavy taxation is to impoverish people. And so uh, people, as they were progressively taxed more and more and more, they became unable to hold on uh, to their land. They became unable to, uh, to, to continue to make the payments on their property, quite simply. And so uh, they, be they became poor. They became impoverished because of overtaxation. And then what the Romans would do, step three, step one, taxation, step two, impoverishment, step three, um, they would come in and seize the land of the Jews who were now impoverished and take it as their own and begin to farm it themselves so that they could reap the benefits of the property. Okay, now, as you can imagine, this three-step process of taxation, impoverishment, and um, expropriation of their land, ex appropriation, the taking of their land, okay? This three-step process only enraged the Jewish people even more, only made them want to get rid of the Romans even more, okay? So it was in the midst of this that uh, Jesus appeared on the scene, okay? So, here we are around the year 30 A.D. This is about the time, more or less, when Jesus appears on the scene and begins his public ministry, begins uh, to preach to, uh, to the Jewish people who would listen to him. Now, what was the main theme of his preaching? What was the main theme of the preaching and the ministry of Jesus. I have a suspicion, because I've heard this so often in other classes, that you're thinking, well, he came to say, love one another. Or he came to say, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Or he came to say, I have come to take away your sins. Or he came to say, I have come to lead you to, to heaven, to eternal life, if you uh, merely accept me. And although each one of those things is an interpretation of what Jesus said and did, it appears not to have been uh, what he was actually trying to accomplish. The main theme, from my research, the main theme of the preaching and the ministry of Jesus revolved around this. A simple phrase. The reign of God is near at hand. The reign of God, reign, R-E-I-G-N, the kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God is in your midst. So what is he saying in effect when he says that? He is saying that the new age, the, es the eschaton, the eschaton, the final age, a new age of the world, had already begun with his coming. Okay? Jesus is proclaiming the beginning of the final age, the end of the age of the Romans, the beginning of the age of the reign of God. Okay? And so, keep this in mind. The preaching of Jesus is, in effect, quite rebellious and it would have been understood by the people he was preaching to as being quite rebellious and it would have been understood by the Romans who heard about him eventually as being quite rebellious and he did so openly okay look at uh, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 verse 14 1 14 After John had been arrested, Jesus went into Galilee. There he proclaimed the good news from God. The time has come, he said. The time has come. And the kingdom of God is close at hand. 
The kingdom of God, the reign of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Okay, so the main, uh, the main theme of Jesus' preaching is merely that. The reign of God is close at hand. The reign of God is in your midst. The reign of God is already here. The new age has begun. And so Jesus, when they first, or I'm sorry, when the Jews first heard this, they must have thought, wow, this is fantastic. This is great. Now, here's the guy who's going to uh, lead us in the battle. He's going to defeat the Romans, and, and we're going to take over, and we're going to be powerful again. And as you know, that's not what happened. And so, how did Jesus act out? What were the... Uh, the, what were the signs, what were the characteristics of his uh, ministry? What were the characteristics of the reign of God which he proclaimed and which he lived out? What were, in other words, or another way to put it, what were the signs of Jesus' rebelliousness? What were the signs that Jesus showed to demonstrate that he was a rebel against the Romans? First of all, Open healing, first characteristic of the reign of God, first characteristic of Jesus' rebelliousness. Open healing. Doesn't sound very rebellious, and yet it was. Jesus, as you know, healed many, 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 many people, almost anybody who would come to him. And there's, there are so many different examples. If you look at Mark chapter 1, verses 23 through 27. In their synagogue just then there was a man possessed by an unclean spirit and it shouted, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus said sharply, Be quiet, come out of him. And the unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions and with a loud cry went out of him. The people were so astonished that they started, to, they started asking each other what it all meant. Here is a teaching that is new, they said, and with authority behind it. He gives orders even to unclean spirits and they obey him. Wow. So... Uh, what is the characteristic? What characterizes uh, Jesus' healing? And why is it a sign of rebellion? Well, what makes Jesus' healing so special is that when he heals, he heals using the power of God. There were many healers in Israel in the uh, first century AD at the time of Jesus. Healers were all over the place, just as there are healers now, not doctors, but faith healers. This is what I'm referring to. Uh, medicine was virtually non-existent in the first century AD, but here, uh, but, but there, were, there were healers all over the place. Here you have Jesus healing, not uncommon, but what he does that's different is that he heals using the power of God. He wields the very power of God in order to heal people. Now, why, you might ask, is that a sign of rebellion? What makes healing rebellious? It doesn't sound rebellious at all. Here's the answer. Consider how the Romans used their power. Did they use their power to heal? No, they did not. The Romans used their power not to heal, but to oppress people, to keep people down, to keep people under control, to subjugate people. Jesus, on the other hand, uses God's power to make people's lives better, to heal them, to make them whole, to make them... Uh, to, to, to bring happiness to them, not to, or to, to, to free them, to liberate them, not to oppress them, not to subjugate them, not to put them down. 
He knew that. He knew what he was doing. And the Romans knew what he was doing. And so, while Jesus uses power to heal, the Romans use their power to oppress and to, uh, uh, and to keep people down. Okay? So, open healing is the first sign uh, of, of the reign of God in, uh, in Jesus' uh, preaching and ministry. Second sign of the reign of God. Second sign of the coming of the reign of God. Shared meals. Shared meals. Now, once again, that sounds pretty tame. Eating is a sign of rebellion? It doesn't sound like much. And yet, I ask you to reflect uh, upon how uh, people have their meals most of the time. How often, and it, let's, let's come forward now to the 21st century. Let's come forward to our own time. Think about it. How often do people of different social classes ever share a meal? How often do you walk into a restaurant and see a poor person eating with a middle class person? or a lower class person, a working class person, eating with a wealthy person. It just doesn't happen very often. Uh, even today, uh, uh, we're, we're very class conscious. And this is, and it, well, and now let's backtrack. Back in the first century, the Romans were the same way. There were people uh, with whom they would, they would never have shared a meal. It just would not have happened. Okay, they were as class conscious then as we are class conscious now, and so they they never would have thought about sharing a meal uh, with someone who was beneath them. Basically, with uh, most people who uh, were Jews. This is what characterizes uh, Jesus' meals and what makes them signs of rebellion. When Jesus shares a meal. Everyone is invited. No one is turned away. All are welcome. Men, women, rich and poor, children, adults, Romans, it doesn't matter. All are welcome. Um, for example, uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 15. Mark 2 15. I'm adjusting my webcam just a little bit. Mark 2, 15. When Jesus was at dinner in his house, and this is Levi, the son of Alphaeus, not his own house, but when he was having dinner in the house of Levi, a number of tax collectors and sinners were also sitting at the table with Jesus and his disciples. Wow. Wow. For there were many of them among his followers. When the scribes of the Pharisees, uh, of the Pharisee party, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? To them, this was ridiculous. To them, this was wrong. You didn't eat with people like this. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, It is not the healthy who need the doctor but the sick. I did not come to call the virtuous, but sinners. Keep uh, something else in mind when you read this about um, tax collectors. Okay, Who was a tax collector in, um, in ancient Israel at the time of the Roman occupation? A tax collector was someone who was appointed by um, the Romans uh, even though he was a Jew. They were Jews appointed by Romans to tax uh, a certain group of people. And so they, they, they would say, you go out to um, X town, you go out to, go out to Collinsville, let's take a town in Illinois, you go out to Collinsville, you collect X amount of taxes, you have to collect $50,000 in taxes, okay? Then, over and above that, whatever else you can get from people, 
that's yours. That's your pay. And so the tax collectors would go around and um, you know they'd say, hey, I need you know I need your fifty bucks. I need your hundred bucks. I need your five hundred bucks. And, uh, and and while you're at it, uh, I, I like that uh, gold watch that you're wearing, or I'd like that uh, necklace that your that your that your wife is wearing, okay? Or your chariot or what, whatever. I'm being facetious. And 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 so you can imagine how hated the tax collectors must have been, because they were robbers, they were thieves, they were extortionists. They could take whatever they could get in order to um, uh, meet their quota of taxes and also to make a living. That's number one. Then look at sinners. Sinners were considered outcasts. To be a sinner was, was to be uh, socially uh, unacceptable. To be a sinner was to be, was to be uh, outcast. Okay? So here you have Jesus not only re, not not only not rejecting tax collectors and sinners, he's eating dinner with them. It, that must have scandalized a number of people, Jews and Romans alike. But this is the way Jesus rolled. This is the way Jesus lived his life. Let's his public ministry. So now let's look at Mark, uh, chapter six, verse thirty-five. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 35. So Jesus is preaching in the boat and the people are listening to him because it's such a big crowd. He's, he's done uh, preaching now. Verse 35. By now it was getting very late and his disciples came up to him and said, This is a lonely place and it is getting very late. So send them away and they can go to the farms and villages round about to buy themselves something to eat. He replied, Give them something to eat yourselves. They answered, Are we to go and spend 200 denarii on bread for them to eat? How many loaves have you? He asked. Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all, all the people, all the people together in groups on the green grass. And they sat down on the, gr on the ground in squares of hundreds and fifties. That's an interesting thing. Sat down in squares of hundreds and fifties. I don't know what that means. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, raised his eyes to heaven, and said the blessing. Then he broke the loaves and handed them to his disciples to distribute among the people. He also shared out the two fish among them all. They all ate as much as they wanted. They collected twelve basketfuls of scraps of bread and pieces of fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. So five thousand men means probably, what, ten or fifteen thousand people. Uh, in all likelihood, an exaggeration. The point, the religious truth that's being uh, declared here is that Jesus feeds everybody that everyone is welcome. So, in the reign of God, uh, uh, meals, in the reign of God, shared eating, meals, is a sign of unity. Is a sign of unity. All, everyone, comes together to share the meal. That was not the way the Romans acted. In the reign of the Romans, um, meals were not shared by all. Okay, so meals were not a sign of unity, but a sign of disunity. In the, in the reign of the Romans, meals are disunity. In the reign of God, meals are a sign of unity and a sign of rebellion. So Jesus is saying, God's reign is being established. Things are different now. Things are different. Okay, that's the second characteristic of the reign of God. Third characteristic is wandering. Not wandering, but wandering around. Having no, uh, having no home. Uh, the fancy title for it is radical itinerancy. And now we'll see how long the phone rings, but I'm going to keep talking. So, 
Um, wandering refers to, of course, not settling down in one place, uh, moving from place to place. So, why did Jesus himself wander, and why did he attract people who wander? Why would he have done that? And why would he have attracted people who did the same thing? Go back to what I said a few, uh, just a few minutes ago about um, what the Romans were doing to the Jews. They were taxing them, they were making them poor, and they were um, taking away their land. So once people had lost their land, they had no home. So what were they to do? They had to wander. And Jesus wandered with them. He led them in their wandering. And he did this for a very specific religious reading he, reason. He did it to illustrate life in the reign of God. This, is, this was his message. This was the message behind his wandering. He was trying to say, in the reign of God, people trust not in their possessions, not in their homes, not in their land, but they place all their trust in God. It's a radical message, isn't it? It's a radical message. It's one, first of all, that's entirely consistent with Judaism. Trust only God. It's a, it's a long-standing Jewish theme. Place all of your trust in God and only in God. And secondly, wandering is a sign of rebellion against the Romans. Because what were the Romans doing? The Romans were placing their trust, their security, uh, their future, basing their future on their acquisition of land. Jesus, on the other hand, says, don't place your trust in your possessions. Don't worry about your land. Don't worry about what you are to eat or what you are to drink or what you are to wear, right? Place your trust in God. And so, um, trust, complete trust in God is a sign of life in the reign of God, whereas the acquisition of property and the buildup of empire is a characteristic of the reign of the Romans. And so wandering is an act of rebellion against the Romans. It's a way of saying to the Romans, no, 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 we, we're, we're living a new way of life now. Your way of life is over, and our way of life is going to take its place. Do you see how Jesus is truly a rebel? That his message was a message to the people of his time, and it was a message that had to do with this world, not really not so much the, the next life, uh, our, our life after death, but life in this world at this time. Okay? His message was very much this worldly, not otherworldly. Fourth characteristic we have healing, we have shared meals, we have wandering, and now the uh, fourth characteristic is um, fundamental equality equality. Okay? Um, you know that Jesus spent a good deal of time with the outcasts of society. That he spent his time with the poor. He spent his time with the sick, with lepers, with tax collectors, with Samaritans, with women, with lepers all of whom were um, people not accepted, not in good social standing. Many of them not in the Jewish world, all of them not in the Roman world. These are the people whom Jesus decides, chooses to hang out with, the outcasts of society. Imagine what we would think today about someone who hangs out with prostitutes. You know we, know, we know what we would think about that type of person, and yet, Jesus did that. Um, so what was he trying to say about the reign of God? He is saying that in the reign of God, 
everyone is an equal. Everyone is a brother and sister. Um, everyone belongs to the reign of God. And why is that? It's because everyone is created by God. Everyone is created as he knew and as we believe now. Everyone is created in the very image of God. And so for that reason, every human being is, is good, A, and B, every human being is truly um, a brother uh, or, or a sister. Now, is this the way the Romans treated uh, other people? You know the answer to that question. Absolutely not. The Romans always thought that they were better than the people whom they uh, subjugated. They always thought that they were better than their subjects. And Jesus' equality is a sign of rebellion against that attitude and against that behavior. Jesus' equality is a way of saying, Romans, your day is done. Uh, your style is over, and you guys are over. You're going to be going away. And now, in this new reign of God, all people are going to be considered equal, and all people are going to be treated equally. I'll direct you to Mark chapter 3, verses, verse 31. Mark 3:31 His mother and brothers now arrived and standing outside sent in a message asking for him A crowd was sitting round him at the time the message was passed to him Your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you He replied Who are my mother and my brothers and looking around at those sitting in a circle about him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of God, that person is my brother and sister and mother. That's number one. Another example, Mark chapter 5, verse 25. Matthew 5.25 Now, there was a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for twelve years. After long and pa painful treatment under various doctors, she had spent all she had without being any better, any the better for it. In fact, she was getting worse. She had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his cloak. If I can touch even his clothes, she had told herself, I shall be well again. And the source of the bleeding dried up instantly, and she felt in herself that she was cured of her complaint. Immediately aware that power had gone out from him, Jesus turned round in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing round you, and yet you say, Who touched me? But he continued to look all round to see who had done it. Then the woman came forward, frightened and trembling, because she knew what had happened to her, and she fell at his feet and told him the whole truth. My daughter, he said, your faith has restored you to health. Go in peace and be free from your complaint. So here you have Jesus interacting with the woman. Know now that um, for the most part it was highly improper for a man to speak to a woman in public. And yet here he is, flagrantly breaking the rules, but for a, a, a deeper reason. Okay, there's other examples of Jesus' uh, equality, but those are, you know, some of the best. All right. So these are the four main characteristics of Jesus uh, preaching about the reign of God: healing, shared meals. Wandering, equality. And each one of these is a sign of life in the reign of God and a sign of rebellion against the Romans. Healing. Jesus heals with the power of God. 
the Romans used their power not to heal, but to oppress. Jesus shares meals with everyone and anyone. The Romans, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus shares meals as a sign of unity in the reign of God. The Romans do not share meals. The Romans do not promote unity. Jesus wanders in order to say that it is more important to place trust in God, complete trust in God, than it is to trust possessions. The Romans trust their possessions and their land, and they're trying to accumulate more. Jesus hangs out with the outcasts, the unacceptable people of society, in order to say that each person, each person is a brother or sister because each person is created by God. And so in the reign of God, all are equals. This is a sign of rebellion against the Romans who do not treat their subjects with equality, but who consider themselves to be better than uh, the people uh, whom they are in charge of. Okay? So, now, next thing. I have already spoken a little bit about Jesus... Uh, well, I've already uh, spoken a little bit about eschatology, that the Jewish people um, had an eschatological theme to them, an eschatological expectation that God was about to bring in a final age, that God was going to come in and take care of the Romans and get rid of the Romans and restore Israel to its former greatness. Jesus believed the same thing. But there, is, there are two things that are markedly different, significantly different, about Jesus' eschatology than the two other types of eschatology that were present at the time of Jesus. Okay? The Reign of God movement is the first example of eschatology that I will cite. It is called ethical eschatology. You know what ethics is. You know what it means to be ethical. So ethical eschatology. I'll spell it. E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Eschatology. Ethical eschatology, the eschatology of Jesus, um, actively protests against the reign of the Romans. Jesus did that. However, uh, well, number one, it's an act of protest against the Romans. Number two, it is uh, Jesus believed that God was about to uh, come down and make things right. There was going to be the, a great cleanup of the Romans, and God was going to restore his rule to Israel. But two things. First thing. Two things were different about Jesus' eschatology than the other types of eschatology that I'm going to explain. First of all, for Jesus, God would act in a non-violent manner in order to bring about the reign of God. Jesus did not believe in a violent God, and so therefore a, a non-violent God had to act in a non-violent manner in order to bring in the reign of God. So Jesus' reign of God movement is, is, uh, uh, is different in, for, in one way because it was a movement of nonviolence. Even at the moment of his death, Jesus continues to be nonviolent. He tells Peter to put away his sword, and he says, you know, I could call down legions of angels, but I'm not going to do it. So the reign of God, first of all, is nonviolent. And second of all, Jesus believed that God would act, but that God would act only if and when his people acted. In other words, God was waiting for his people to uh, get rid of the Romans through their nonviolence, through their healing sharing meals, wandering, and equality. Okay? So, 
ethical eschatology. It's an active protest against the Romans. It is a belief that God is about to come and get rid of the Romans and usher in a final age, a new age of glory. But the God of Jesus is a nonviolent God, and the reign of God is a nonviolent rebellious movement. People do not take up weapons in this rebellion. They take up the weapons, if you will, the weapons of, of nonviolence, healing, meals, wandering, equality. Okay? And God uh, would act, but God is, Jesus believed, God is waiting for us to act in order for him to be able to usher in the reign of God. Okay, so Jesus' eschatology, his ethical eschatology, is radically different. Okay, it's radically different than the other types of uh, uh, eschatology that were prevalent at the time of Jesus. The other two are these. The first one is called apocalyptic eschatology. Long word, sorry about that, two long words. Apocalyptic, A-P-O-C-A, L-Y-P. T I C apocalyptic eschatology. The apocal those who believed in apocalyptic eschatology believe that God was about to uh, get rid of the Romans. Believe that a Messiah was coming to do it. But according to the apocalyptic people, God would act with violence. He would strike down the Romans with the sword. He would slaughter the Romans, and the Messiah remember, was this warrior king who would, uh, through military action, slaughter the Romans, just as David was a military man before he became king. The Zealot Party, Z-E-A-L-O-T, the Zealots were the people who believed in apocalyptic eschatology. Yes, it was, a, it was a movement of social, it was a movement of rebellion, but it was a movement of military rebellion. It was uh, uh, the belief that people had to take up their weapons and defeat the Romans militarily, that that's what God wanted. That's the group. It was the zealot group that led the rebellion of, uh, of the year 66 A.D. and uh, who were ultimately uh, uh, defeated. Okay? So that's apocalyptic eschatology. That's the second kind. Ethical, apocalyptic, the third kind. Ascetical eschatology. Sure, I'll spell that. Ascetical. A S C E T I C A L. Ascetical eschatology. Those who believed in ascetical eschatology also uh, b believed that there should be a rebellion against the Romans, that the Romans needed to be kicked out of Israel. But here's how they approached it. The people who believed in ascetical eschatology uh, decided to withdraw into the desert, to hang out by themselves, and to wait for God to do what he was going to do out there in the desert. The people who embodied ascetical eschatology was a group of people known as the Essenes. The Essenes. E-S-S-E-N-E-S. The Essenes were virtually unknown until around 1945 when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. You may have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls um, contain information about the Essenes and uh, told us that there was this group of people who were rebels against the Romans who were uh, waiting for God to defeat the Romans, but whose approach to doing it was to remove themselves out into the desert, and they went out into the, uh, the, the area around the Dead Sea, and they prayed and they waited for God to come and act and take care of the Romans, get rid of the Romans. So you have three different uh, expectations, three different kinds of movements at the time of Jesus. You have Jesus' reign of God movement, ethical, eschatology. You have um, the uh, uh, eschatology of the zealots, the go get them, let's beat them, let's, let's defeat them in battle. That's apocalyptic eschatology. And you have 
the eschatology of the Essenes, those monks who uh, withdrew into the desert to wait for God to uh, uh, defeat the Romans. That's ascetical eschatology. Okay. Now, Jesus, as we know, died for the sake of the reign of God. He was willing to go all the way to death. Um, Jesus' public ministry was probably about one year in length. Hard to say for sure. It appears as though it would have been about one year in length. And um, so why and how did he die? Well, you know that from the Gospels, or we know from the Gospels, that every year at Passover time, uh, the Jews assembled. The Jews assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And so at that time, there were far more Jews hanging out in Jerusalem than there were Romans. That threatened the Romans, as you can imagine. You have 500,000 Jews and you have 25,000 soldiers. Mm, it's an easy way for rebellion to break out, isn't it? And so what the Romans would routinely do at around Passover time would, would be to pick a rebel out of the crowd. Pick someone who was a, a rabble rouser, pick them out of the crowd, and have that person crucified. As a way of saying to everybody else, okay, see, if you don't want to settle down, if you don't stay under control, this is what I'm going to do to you. And so one person was chosen to make, as an example, to tell everybody else, okay, you better stop. One person or maybe a few. It appears as though this is what happened to Jesus. Jesus came to Jerusalem around Passover. The Romans knew who he was. They knew he was a rebel. They knew he was actively trying to, to, to get rid of the Romans. And so they decided uh, to make an example of him. And that's, so they had him arrested. They brought him up for trial. And they crucified him. So Jesus went all the way to death. In order to, um, because, or because of his faith in the reign of God. And we know from the Gospels that Jesus' faith was vindicated in the resurrection on that Easter uh, morning. And that from there on, his apostles began to preach what they believed uh, about Jesus and about the reign of God. Okay. Um, I hope that's clear. I hope my explanation about Jesus' reign of God movement is somewhat clear. I certainly hope so. I wish I could have been there to give it to you in person. All right. So, in the few minutes that I have left, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to first explain the differences between the Christianity of Jesus and the Christianity of Paul, or to show what Paul did to the Christian message in order to um, make a change. He reinterpreted Christianity uh, about 10 or 20 years after the time of Christ. So, in Jesus' time, Jesus' ministry... The scope of his ministry, the scope of his activity, was Israel. So first of all, scope. What was the extent of his ministry? It was the land of Israel. In fact, for the most part, it was the Galilee region of, um, of Israel. Second, what was the focus of his ministry? The focus of his ministry was the reign of God. It was rebellion against the Romans by bringing in a nonviolent reign of God. Third, what was the effort what was his effort to reform or what was I'm sorry, what was his effort vis-a-vis -vis Judaism? What was he trying to do to Judaism? He was trying to reform Judaism. He was trying to um, take Judaism in a different direction through his beliefs about God, the Messiah, and, uh, and, and, the, and the eschaton, the coming final age. And finally, um, what, uh, what were his main activities? You know that already. Healing, meals, wandering, equality. Now, Paul, some 15 to 20 years later, makes some quite radical changes um, to the message, the ministry, the, the action of, of Jesus. Okay? For example, where 
the, Jesus' own scope of ministry was the land of Israel. Paul expanded it to the entire world. In fact, he expanded it to the entire universe. Okay? Very big change. Okay? Paul became convinced that the message of Jesus um, was for all of humanity. It was for the whole world. Jesus said on more than one occasion that his ministry was for the lost sheep of Israel. That his ministry was to the people of Israel. Paul saw it in broader terms than that. And Paul said the message of Jesus should be for everyone in the world. Not only that, but it should be for the entire universe. And so he said that Jesus, he placed Jesus' um, ministry in a much broader context. He said that Jesus came to undo the sin of Adam and Eve. That, in other words, all of history had been put out of whack by the uh, sin of Adam and Eve, the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and Jesus came to restore the human race, the entire human race, not just the Jews, not just the Greeks, but the entire human race, restore the entire human race to right relationship with God. Okay, that's the scope. The focus of Jesus' uh, message, as I said, was the reign of God and resisting the Romans, rebelling against the Romans. The focus of Jesus' ministry, according to Paul, was sin and redemption from sin. Okay, That's a huge shift from the reign of God to Jesus. Uh, what Jesus did was to save humanity from its sin, was to redeem humanity from the sin of Adam and Eve. Where Jesus seems to have believed that his ministry was about reforming Judaism, Paul uh, preached that Jesus came um, to supersede Judaism, to uh, go beyond Judaism, and in fact to replace Judaism. Okay? Very, very different, isn't it? Reform of Judaism, replace Judaism. Jesus understood his primary uh, uh, activity as healing, sharing meals, wandering, and equality. Paul said that Jesus' uh, primary activity was his death on the cross. And that what, and what believers needed to do was accept in faith what Jesus had done for them by dying on the cross. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And so many of the, the, the themes of the basic themes of Christianity that we are familiar with today come to us um, through Jesus, but they come to us from Paul. Okay? Something something to keep in mind. Now uh, next thing and last thing is to talk for just a couple of minutes about um, the, fir the letter to the Galatians. By way of introduction, the letter to the Galatians was, uh, was written in about 54 or 55 A.D. Uh, most or all of the letters of Paul, of Paul were composed during the decade of the 50s. So we're looking at somewhere between 20 and 30 years after the death of Christ and were also about 20 to anywhere from 20 to 50 years before the writing or the completion of the four Gospels that we have. In Galatians, Paul is writing to, to defend the authority of his own teaching. He is making the claim that he is an apostle, even though he's not one of the original uh, 12 apostles, that he is still an apostle. In Galatians, Paul is facing the challenge of those Christians who were called Judaizers. Judaizer, J-U-D-A-I-Z-E-R-S. Judaizers. The Judaizing Christians were those who believed that people who became followers of Christ should continue to adhere to all of the laws of Judaism. 
the dietary laws, the kosher laws, circumcision, all the Sabbath, all those other things. Paul, as you know, did not agree with that. In Paul's view, the message of Jesus was for everyone. It was for Gentiles as well as for Jews. And so Galatians is written in that context. Okay, Paul in Galatians defends the freedom of Christians from the Jewish law. Because of their baptism, they are free from Jewish law. And he also uh, makes the claim that his view of Christianity, in other words, the gospel, his view of Christianity is acceptable, that it's valid. All right, so again, quickly, in chapter 1, Paul is uh, defending his message as being from Christ. That is not merely a human message, but that his message comes um, through him, but that it comes from Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1. I said I would go quickly. Chapter 2. Um, Paul notes that his gospel was approved by the Council of Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem was a gathering of the apostles around the year 50. And this whole question of the Judaizers versus the non-Judaizers was debated. And um, the non-Judaizing, or Paul, Pauline view, actually uh, won out. Okay, so Paul is saying, yeah, my view of Christianity is perfectly valid. It was approved. It is so valid, it was approved by the apostles when they met in Jerusalem in around the year 50. Okay, Paul goes on to say that Christians are justified by their faith in Christ. Christians are justified by their faith in Christ and not by the Jewish law. You can see here, we're talking about something brand new. You can see in Paul, we're beginning to move Christianity just a bit away from Judaism. Something that would happen after the time of Paul. Chapter 3. In chapter 3, Paul continues to discuss his theme of how humanity is saved uh, by faith in Christ and not by the law. And he uses the example of Abraham uh, to, to prove his point. Uh, he uses the, the, the story of Abraham. Paul says that Christ in himself has eliminated the distinction between Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female. In other words, Jesus has removed all the artificial distinctions that people make between themselves, between Jew and Gentile, Jew and Greek, slave person and free person, male and female, because he says that in Christ, in Christ, and here he picks up the same theme that Jesus uh, preached in his ministry. He says that in Christ, all are one. All are one. Okay, in chapter 4, Paul um, continues his discussion in, of Christian freedom, and again, in Christianity, where is freedom found? According to Paul, it is found in Christ. It is not found in the Jewish law. Um, and, and he resorts again to the analogy of Abraham and his two sons. Um, the one son, Ishmael, who was born of Hagar, the slave woman, and the other son, Isaac, uh, born of, of, of Sarah, who was a free woman. And so he ends in verse 28 by saying, Now we, brethren, like Isaac, are children of the promise. In other words, uh, we are um, the children who are freed by Christ. We are born in freedom as Isaac was born in freedom. Okay? Chapter 5. Paul warns the Galatian Christians to either choose Christ and the freedom that comes with it or to choose the old law, the Jewish law, and therefore remain in slavery to that law. Okay? And he warns that people who accept circumcision are uh, obligated to observe not just circumcision, but are obligated to observe all of the Jewish law. In other words, they're obligated to remain in their slavery to the law rather than superseding the law by uh, by, by, by finding their freedom in Christ. And then finally in chapter 6, 
Paul says that those who are saved in Christ should correct those who are in error, should, should correct those who are, have gone down the wrong path, but that, but that they should do this in a loving and charitable way. He concludes, the, the letter to the Galatians concludes by saying that those who are saved by Christ are, quote, a new creation. That they are a new creation. Remember I said that the, the obedience of Jesus turns history all the way around. It, it flips history uh, on its head. So now, in Christ, we are a new creation. We're starting over. It's day one. Okay, And uh, Paul says that he finds his glory only in the cross of Christ. Okay, Not in his uh, Jewish uh, tradition. He was a Jew. But he finds his glory in the cross of Christ. So there you have it. That concludes our little discussion uh, about the Christian scriptures. There is so, so, so much more that we could have said. But um, that's all we have time for. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again uh, next week. Take care and thanks for watching.